Hey Health Junkies, it's time for The Health Fix. Join your host doctor, Janine Krause, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hello there, Health Chunkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krause. Today's episode is a treat. One of the things that I see in my practice and in myself is the effect of fear on the body. Of course, there are rational fears like fears of spiders and snakes and things of that nature. But there are also deconstructive fears that keep each and every one of us from reaching our full potential. These fears build up so strongly that they affect our mental and physical health. Anxiety, depression, anger, irritability, and even fatigue all have roots in fear. Owning your fear allows you to use it constructively to transform your life, which is pretty cool if you ask me. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Carla Marie Manley. She's a clinical psychologist, a wellness expert, and author of two amazing books, Joy From Fear and Aging Joyfully. I found her book, Joy From Fear, and loved the life-changing exercises at the end of each chapter. The book was so packed with valuable, thought-provoking chapters that I had to share her information with all of you. So today, Dr. Manley is going to be talking all about the importance of exploring and embracing your fear's messages so you can turn deconstructive fear into constructive fear to optimize your extraordinary self. So let's jump into the podcast. Hey, health junkies, I have a treat for you today. I have Carla Marie Manley. She is the author of two books that she wrote in one year. And I'm obsessed with her first book, Joy from Fear, so much so that I didn't even get to the Aging Joyfully book yet because I was so engrossed in doing the homework on Joy from Fear that I just couldn't handle myself. So Dr. Manley, say hello to the Health Fix Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You are a treat for me because I I actually stalked you to get you on the show because I think your information is so important because as we were talking before we started recording, you had mentioned that folks will come to you because they're so they're, they're in the state of fear to even talk to their doctors about what situations they have going on in life and finding that empowerment that you can help to provide them is something that I, of course, live by and love to have my folks folks be empowered to take control of their health. So tell us a little bit about this fear concept as it, you know, what is fear? How does it keep us from doing all the things we want to do in life? Okay. So the way I like to break it down initially is that there is a constructive part of fear that, you know, basic fear that is good for us. It is the fear that keeps us in the crosswalk, that keeps us from going 80 miles on the freeway when we should be going 65, right? Fear of a rattlesnake. That is very good rational fear. So let's set that aside. We want that fear. It's helpful to us. But there's this other huge aspect of fear that we aren't even aware of many times. And I break that type of fear, irrational fear, down into destructive fear and constructive fear and then move over here to transformational fear. What is destructive fear? Destructive fear is that often very dark, very mean, very critical, very shooting best friend that is not really a best Mm -hmm. friend. It's just snuck into our life, often in early childhood. And it tells us that we are not worthy, that we should do this, that we should do that, that we must look like this, that we should compare ourselves to that person. And it is this often silent, but insidious tape that is keeping us stuck and immobilized and prevents us from being our better self. Now, we're so busy moving forward in life, busy making ends meet and paying the bills and writing kids and, and doing all of these things that we don't realize how much this destructive fear is controlling our lives. So if we learn to slow down and pause and begin to listen 
to destructive fear, to simply know it exists and to realize how controlling it is, then up pops this thing called constructive fear. And this thing is truly one of your best friends. It's not immobilizing and want to handcuff you the way destructive fear does. It is the other side, you know, the light and the shadow. This is the light side that says very quietly, it's not loud and vicious like destructive fear is. It's very quiet and it will tell you your truth. It will say, wait a second. You're actually tired, so no, you don't need to volunteer for the 29th thing this week. No, you don't need to do this. Uh, You don't need to accept that person's verbal abuse. Um, Oh, this is how you stand up for yourself. So it starts talking to you if you slow enough down, slow down enough to listen to it and cultivate its presence because it's there. (laughs) Now, here's where it gets even trickier. So sometimes my clients or people will get to that stage where they they can start tuning into this positive, this essence of who they are, because we are, in essence, positive creatures, and we've just become inundated with all of this destructive fear. Once we really tune into it and tune into it, uh uh-oh, what happens? We start getting afraid because this voice of constructive fear, uh uh-oh, it signals change. It means, okay, all of those patterns that aren't healthy for us, even if they're not healthy, they're still familiar. And I call this part being comfortably uncomfortable. And then once we start awakening to this voice of constructive fear, we know we have to do something. We know we have to start changing because now we're aware of how uncomfortable we are. I mean, we're acutely aware of it. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh, that's transformational fear, knocking and saying, take action one step at a time, itsy bitsy steps. Destructive fear will come in and say, no, no, don't change, or you're not changing fast enough. And constructive fear, if we listen to it, will allow us to set macro goals and micro goals underneath that and it will allow us the patience and the perseverance it will allow us to do the work to create the transformation that we so want we ultimately truly want it even if it is scary and we deserve it so that's it in a nutshell i love it i love it so a lot of people are probably thinking like oh yeah i've heard this before i you know i've got my fears and then i have to deal with them and then i have to work through it but they might be thinking, you know, yeah, I can read a book, but it's not really going to get me anywhere. But this is the caveat. This is why I wanted you on the podcast, because your book actually works you through the destructive fear, the constructive fear, and the transformational fear to be basically working from ground zero all the way to your new self, which I believe I made made some notes here. Um, how to optimize your extraordinary self is something that you noted in the book. And that's something that I like the workbook style of your book because you're going through all the scenarios. And I think I found myself raising my hand in multiple situations. Yep, that's me. Yes, I have that particular destructive fear. Now, Let's talk a little bit about that con- deconstructive fear, or deconstructive, there's one word, destructive fear, in terms of how it keeps us from, from getting to our goals and how it keeps us from moving forward. Because I think a lot of people might be thinking, well, yeah, I have fears. Maybe they're spiders being alone, because you had mentioned the, the topic of all of the different fears that are out there. But perhaps we can tell folks a little bit about how these these fears control us and what are common ways that they might control us that we can work through with your book. Okay. So I think you really hit on it that that, that is why I wrote Joy from Fear the way I did. I wanted people who either can't afford therapy or don't have access to therapy or in a remote location or prefer to work in a kula, a group of women or a group of men, that I wanted Joy from Fear to be a best friend to be a manual and then have, you know, a little binder, a little journal that becomes, this is just such the beautiful part, it becomes the witness to your journey. 
it becomes your work so that you can refer back to it. So that's thank you for picking up on that. That is what makes Joy from Fear unique. It allows you to do the work as you read in as much depth as you want or as superficially <laughs> as you want. I've had clients go through it on you know three times already and each time deepening the work. And that makes sense because sometimes the psyche can take only so much uncovering at a time. You know, we want to keep keep um, peeling the onion. So here's a good example, getting to your question. I love using examples because they help us feel like we're normal, mm-hmm. like we're all connected in these very basic ways. So I run a women's group on Thursday night. One of the most common things I get from women and people in general, it happens with men as well, is they are afraid to speak their truth. They're afraid to stand up for themselves. They feel like doormats. They feel like, yes, 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 I want to please everyone. Don't want, I'm walking on eggshells. I don't want to, to harm anyone or make anyone mad at me. Oh, God, I don't want anyone to be mad at me. And so I do an exercise. I actually used to do it quite a lot where I would have a bowl of candy in the women's group. And I would pass it around, say, everyone, take a piece of candy, take a couple if you want, and pass around the candies. And then I'd take the bowl and I'd set it beside me. And then I would say to the women one at a time, give me your candy. Hand me, oh, give me that piece of candy. Oh, hand me that. I want yours. And they would give them to me. <laughs> they would just turn over their candy to me. Not one woman would say, well, wait a second, you just gave them to me. Or, no, I like this. I, you, you could have this one, but I like this. And I would use that as an example for them to see how when we have someone that we perceive to be in a position of authority, or power for any reason, whether it's a boss, a husband, you know, a doctor, whatever it is, that we still can ask, we still can question, we can still always stand up for ourselves. Some of the women would not get the lesson, even in that first round, I would have to say, here, hand me your purse, give me your wallet. And some of them would return it over. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, no. No, and and I, I'm not blaming or shaming anyone. In fact, I'm kind of laughing at it because we are even more used to that now. We're in a line at an airport. Take off your shoes. Give us your wallet. You know, put it, put your thing, and we're going. Okay, yes, yeah, stand like this, right? <laughs> so we're being indoctrinated to be sheep and to really listen and not question. And so I like teaching people that um, it's okay to ask questions. We want to do it respectfully. We want to do it kindly. But absolutely, if someone asks for your candy or you're at a doctor's office and you, so, it, you know, be able to say, train yourself to say, and what is that test for? Or why are you not running this test? Or why are you wanting my candy when you just gave it to me? Right? That we are, not only do we have permission to speak, not only are we allowed to speak, it's our responsibility to do that. And so that's an example of how, what is the fear underneath that? The fear underneath that, and we will work at it with each woman. What prevented you from asking me why I wanted to take your candy? You know, what part of you wanted to be the good one that didn't ruffle feathers or was afraid to question me, right? So that's how you start getting to your fears, is dismantling everyday situations doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, why why you, you know, didn't ask your tax advisor, you know, why your refund changed so dramatically from the prior year, whatever it is, right? Um, why you feel anxious when you're about to talk to your partner about a heavy topic. What is that about? And being able just to take one situation, even one a day, and dismantle it to find out what's going on. And 99% of the time, if not 100% of the time, it's fear, fear of something. Oh, absolutely. That was a great explanation, especially leading into how there's so many things that we don't even realize they're little things during the day that we will give up our, our power. We just, you know, assume that the tax accountant knows what he's doing. So why would you question it? Same thing goes with the doctor, which is one of my big things that I like to tell my patients right off the bat. I'm your advisor. I'm not here as an authoritative, you know, so, so we're working as a team. 
So another big thing, working with partners and relationships, you mentioned a lot in your book about how your upbringing can set you up for some of the reasons that you have fears, but also you have a great story in the book about a fella. I can't think of his name now. Maybe Thomas was his name. I'm not a hundred percent sure. It wasn't a real one anyway, but you're describing how he, he grew up. And I think I would love to talk about how our, our fears of what happened to us in childhood bring us into having our issues that we have today. Um, and it's funny you bring up Thomas because he is one of the favorite characters in the book, right? And as much as we think many people, particularly men, will come to me and say, my childhood was 50 years ago or 40 years ago. It still can't affect me. It doesn't affect me. I'm big and strong now. And as they gain trust in me and in the process, we learn to dismantle things and figure out that indeed we all are affected for the positive and the negative by our childhoods and that the work is indeed figuring out how mom and dad affected us positively. If there was positive, there's usually at least a bit, (laughs) and not always, and bring, cultivate more of that in our lives. Find out what mom and dad did that wasn't so effective or highly damaging. No blame, no shame, but look at it and say, wow, this wasn't effective. It's not how I want to be in the world. And doing the work that must be done to change that for yourself and the next generation. And I find that because... I, like many of my clients and many people I know, had an incredibly difficult childhood. And do I let that harm me? No, I let it inform me. (laughs) I let it inform me on how to be a better therapist, a more compassionate human being. And as I cultivate that energy with my clients, what they find out is that all of the anger and the fury, and there's a place for anger and fury, that once they released it and processed it, that they had all of this excess energy to use for creating the life that they want. They're no longer stuck in the anger and resentment of the past. They face it, they process it. And that's why Thomas is such a wonderful example because he had no idea that here he has this incredibly successful outward life, you know, has all, every box, his box is checked, just beautiful. But boy, on the inside, there was just a starving, hurt, damaged, highly defended little boy who wanted one thing in life beyond (laughs) material success. And I'm not really sure that he really was all that keen on material success. It just made him feel good. Um, But that inside was this boy who desperately wanted to be loved, who didn't like the the coldness and the lack of love he had grown up with and so had just defended and defended. And as he peeled back those layers, he became a kinder, gentler, where at first, you know, you meet meet him and he's intimidating, he's rude, he's obnoxious, right? But of course, you know, that you know, that's just the facade. But as you find the real person underneath that as with many of my clients, you know, whether they're male or female, often they'll come in, some of them very brittle and, and aggressive. And as they come to love themselves more, and trust me, they become so much more lovely as human beings. And I think that that's why I chose, you know, joy from fear. That's we can talk about, you know, what joy is later. But to me, that's what happens when we do our work. We lose more of the anxiety. We lose more of the depression. We lose more of the chronic stress. And we become more in touch with our natural state of joy. That's huge. That's huge. Especially looking into our relationships with ourselves, our relationships with others. I know in the book, you talk a lot about finding that love for yourself first, and then being able to enjoy life so much better. Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk about a little bit before we jump into joy and finding that is it's kind of working with fears and self-esteem. It seems that there are a lot of fears surrounded around the the concept 
in terms of, or the connection between fear and self-esteem for a lot of individuals. Do you seem to find that uh, overarching theme for the majority of the people that you see? Absolutely. Absolutely. And first, many people confuse self-confidence with self-esteem. So that's worth giving a really quick um, definition of those two. Self-confidence is over here. It's more superficial. It's not characterological in nature. And it is something that we get, a sense of pride, because we're good at something or we have something. So I might feel self-confident because I have a nice smile or a certain haircut or a certain car or, or might be, you know, a certain body style that might be self-confident in that area. I might be self-confident because I'm a good soccer player or a good cook or good IT manager. Okay. Very specific areas of life. Here's the piece with self-confidence. When those areas, if they are diminished in any way, watch what happens to self-confidence. So if my sense of self comes from my looks, and that's you know what I really pride myself on, you know, my athleticism, if I lose that, ooh, there goes my self-confidence. If I lose my job, ooh, there goes my self-confidence. Self-esteem is very different. Self-esteem is grown. We are not born with it. It is something that happens by finding out who we are in life, what our moral compass is, our code is, learning to live in accord with that, um, learning that when we stumble, as we all do, that we pick ourselves up, we learn the lesson that, that the stumble created, and then moving on. And then what we get is this increasing sense of personal power, this increasing sense that I am a good human being. As far as I defined good human being, my, my inner and outer worlds are very congruent. And that creates self-esteem. So how does that relate to fear? Well, given those two definitions, you might be able to see that. If I am not sure of who I am, which often happens, especially with the chaotic childhood or parents who were not present, we, life just kind of takes us where it will, right? And we don't have a lot of direction in cases like that or maybe negative directions. So it's not that one should blame themselves or shame themselves for not having strong self-esteem because so much of it is being taught how that process works hmm. and being taught that it's not about religious strictures or, you know, societal strictures being imposed. It's about feeling that and knowing it from the inside out. So fear, when it senses we are not confident, right, in the self, that we don't have strong self-esteem, oh boy, it loves that. Destructive fear takes that and just <laughs> and it starts the voices going and, and starts the excuses and the rationalizations. And so the person actually can become a prisoner in their own low self-esteem, wanting to look for uh, medication to feel better or a happy pill, pill so you look as happy as your neighbor or a, you know, let me buy this car. I'll feel better. And yes, you might for 32 seconds, right? But it's not going to last. And so fear really invades those with low self-esteem. It really takes root, and then, but it's not a death sentence. And that's why in Joy From Fear, I provide the steps that in a very non-judgmental way help you figure out, maybe for the first time in your life, whether you're 30, 40, 50, however old you are, you might never have known to slow down to figure out your moral compass, your values, your goals, who you want to be. We're not taught this. I wish we were. That's one of my long-term goals. But anyway, I would really like uh, to, to help people learn at an early age that it's about finding out who you are and then living in accord with that, shifting it when you come across something in life that teaches that you that you might want to amplify a certain area or pull back on a certain area, but realizing that that's it's just a process. And the more you live in accord with your, um, with your own moral compass, the one that you have created that is right for you, 
then the more free you feel, the happier you feel, and the stronger your self-esteem is because you are almost unshakable in your truth. I love it. Me too. Me too. And that's kind of what I was finding about with the book is that, yeah, well, one thing I wish we could put this in like kindergarten or preschool and and get it started going then because I feel like I had a point in my life where I would do shows in my basement for my parents and I was, you know, very sure of who I was. And then all of a sudden, certain things started to happen in terms of criticism about, well, mostly my weight. When I was little, I was quite chubby. And that kind of started things in terms of a cascade of how I perceived myself. And and it seemed to cascade from there. I kind of, you know, withdrew and, and went inside a little bit. And I know I'm not alone in this case. And I wonder, you know, going through your book, how many people would find all of the different things that might have happened to them to change their self-esteem. And that's kind of what I went through when I was going through your book. I started to realize this. And thought, wow. Isn't it amazing? And I call them, it's a very, very high level term, mind you. I call them psychic sticky notes. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> that and, and it's it's really their psychic interjects, but I like the idea of saying psychic sticky notes. Here's why: if we're growing up and mommy looks at you and says, "Oh, you're beautiful," psychic sticky note, <laughs> I'm beautiful. When mommy looks at you and says, "You're a great baseball player," psychic you know, sticky note. If daddy walks in and says, "You need to get outside and exercise," you got a fat butt. Psychic sticky note. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're not the smartest kid in the class, but I guess we can't expect more of you. Psychic sticky note, right? So all of those, and you are so right, your experiences. And I work with, I'm working with, don't want to give details, uh, so I'll just say somebody in her 20s. <laughs> and boy, does she have the most well-meaning, loving parents. But my goodness, have they filled her with negative psychic sticky notes? Mm-hmm. Not intentionally, no. but simply things like, well, you're not as really intelligent as your brother, so we need to find you know some other courses for you. Negative psyche, psychic sticky note. Standing over her saying, you know, watching to make sure she does everything perfectly. Psychic sticky notes just by the behavior that are saying, you're not competent on your own. Um, eating and saying, you need to stop eating that. You're getting fat throughout. I mean, huge psychic sticky notes. So what we end up with is a 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 year old. And do I, can I tell you that those sticky notes are still there in my 60 year olds until we dismantle them and help them lose their power that that whether the parent meant good, something it meant something good. For example, a dad who comes in and says, "Hey, go outside and, and play." You know, I want you to exercise that chocolate chip cookie off. Uh, he means well, right? But it's not going to translate well to the kid's brain. Oh, it's yeah. going to translate very negatively, right? Mm-hmm. And those kind of examples. But then there are dads. I have clients who have said, you know, the dad would walk in and say, "Oh my God." When did you grow thighs that size? Things like that that are very overtly, right? But you can imagine the dad probably heard similar things. Or, oh, my God, you're getting fat like your mother. You know, ah! So these things are carried, and then we store them away. Sometimes we cry in the moment, but we generally store them away, and then we just pack more and more of them in, be they good or not so good. And then we wake up one day, and that's one of the purposes of Joy from Fear, to help you wake up. Take out the psychic sticky notes. Are they true? Are they not true? Are they fuel for growth? If they're not true, get rid of them. If it's something about yourself that feels true, like, you know, you're, you're, you know, you could stand to work a little harder. And if that really resonates with you and you really want to work a little harder, use it for personal growth. And if you don't want to use it for personal growth, get rid of it. And that, and clear out those juice. Isn't that beautiful when you think of them as sticky notes and you can just, and sometimes the sticky notes are so strong that you thought you'd get rid of it and there it is. And it comes back. And so you just keep tossing it away until those negative messages finally let go. Because I believe, you know, neurobiologically, 
whatever pathways we're using, they're the negative ones and the old memory ones, they're just going to get stronger. Mm -hmm. But if we train ourselves to the positive and to focus on that which we want rather than that which we don't want, then we'll create the positive pathways. So I think that what you described with, you know, the, the, the messages from the parents, so common, so common in every person I work with. And it's not always the parents. It's sometimes a coach, a grandma, you know, a teacher. Sure. Something that caused that child's forming brain, right, to latch on. Because as you know, our brains, when we're young, we believe everything. Yeah. We believe. That's why we believed in Santa Claus <laughs> and, you know, the, the gold at the end of the rainbow and fairies. That very same brain believes when mommy tells you, you're no good. When daddy tells the 11-year-old she'll grow up to be a slut. Happens. I hear that, right? And the child believes it. Yeah. So it's up to us as adults to let go of that power that we, uh, that, that negative power, that negative energy, that destructive fear that we absorb and all those sticky notes. And now that we become aware of them, we get to look at them and go, don't want that. Somebody placed that there. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask for it. Ah. Yeah. Let's throw that right out. So let's talk a little bit about these, these, I love the term, the psychic sticky notes, because yeah, I'm, as you're mentioning, I'm going, oh yeah, I have quite a few of those still I'm working with them. Now, a lot of people are like, okay, I've been to counseling. I've been to talk therapy. I mean, I have a lot of patients in my practice who are looking for, you know, the alternative care. So not psychotropic medications, things of that nature to help them to get through depression, to help them to get through their anxiety. And they're reaching out for herbs that can help or any, you know, diet, whatever it may be. And a lot of times I'm sitting there going, well, it's, it goes down to, we've got to work on the core. And I say to them, we need to have someone, you know, that you can talk to. And the first thing I get back is I've been through therapy. I've done therapy. And so I love your book because it takes therapy to the next step. It gives people the skills. Now, would you tell folks a little bit in terms of the workbook section of your book, how you're breaking down the homework for folks so that we can understand that your book's not just talk. It's not talk therapy based. It's action therapy. So tell, tell the folks a little bit about the book in terms of how you're getting them to take action. So what I did in the book is build it just like the ABCs. We start with basic things and build up because we need to know our ABCs before we write sentences and then paragraphs. And that's how I look at our fears at first. So one of the things I first do is normalize our emotions normalize and so I one of the things I do is to help people get in touch with their emotions and to know and that's one of the exercises to know that your emotions are all good anger is not bad right sadness isn't bad uh, joy isn't just the good you know that we have I work with the five emotion model of anger sadness um, fear disgust and joy and that how those work and where feelings come from and help people begin to understand the aspect of their bodies that is the emotional intelligence that when you feel an emotion um, and this is how one of the exercises basically works is to help you understand okay I'm talking to my boss and I'm feeling afraid. Okay, where is that fear? Oh, it's right here. Okay. Boy, deep breath in, deep breath out. What's going on with that fear? Why are you afraid? How does it feel? Are you hot back here? Are you hot here? Is your pulse racing? Are you sweating? Getting to know your physical responses, right? So that you cannot be afraid of your own body's responses. Hey, if somebody's coming at me and yelling at me in a parking lot and I feel fear and anger, right? What's happening there? Why am I afraid? What does that feel like? Why am I angry? What does that feel like? And then 
once we become, here's the beauty of it, once we become more aware of our emotions and tuned into our emotions, guess who has the power? We We do. do. We do. Our anxiety won't run our lives anymore. It might come up now and again, but we don't have to be afraid of it. Our fear might come up, but then we get to slow down and differentiate. Is this a helpful fear? Am I alone in the dark alley and there's somebody stalking me? Or is it a fear that's telling me I need to accept this relationship, this person who's being abusive? So, you know, I need to get small and just accept it and be afraid. No! Then we work, right? And so that's so that's an example of how the exercise, one of the exercises, it's one of my favorites, is that we learn how to get to know what our emotions are, that they are not bad, are all good. If I am angry, I am angry because somebody has generally disrespected me. And if somebody disrespects me, I will stand up for myself. Now it's my responsibility how I channel my anger. (laughs) Do I do it safely, securely, respectfully, kindly? Absolutely. It's how we use it. And then if I need to up-level it, you know, then I will to be a little more serious or severe, whatever it is. But that's one thing we as women, we as people often forget. Men are taught that they are allowed to be angry and fine. (laughs) <laughs> Those are their two, two emotions, so to speak. Women, we are taught that we're allowed to be happy and sad. And that's it. Happy and sad. Or fine. We get fine as well. <laughs> but even that, we can't be, we're allowed to be really, really happy. But if we're too happy, then somebody might think we're on drugs. <laughs> if we're too sad, then, you know, we're a downer and we're depressed and we're overly emotional. But as far as a woman be, uh, being allowed to embrace her anger, um, then you're immediately a witch mm-hmm. or worse. And so many women will flip. They will skip being assertive because they never learned assertive, and they will flip to being aggressive, not realizing that they have any way of feeling anger and expressing anger in a constructive way. So that's an example of how the exercises guide you into learning you. Because the more you learn you, the unique way you are, but also the way we are all, you know, we have commonalities, the more powerful you, you'll feel. And then you, I take you through different or different steps throughout the book. One of them, one of my favorites, is when we get to relationships because I'm big on the impact of our relationships on the self, the relationship with you, relationship with whatever partners in your life or your friends. And so many of the people I meet will come to me and say their relationships are out of whack, that they're in a toxic relationship or an abusive relationship or a one-sided relationship. And so I ha- one of my favorite exercises really helps people focus on What is it that you want in your relationship with you? What is it that you want in your relationship with the other? And then I have people, I love this piece, of looking at the essential qualities. And that's what I call them. What are the essential qualities that I require to be in relationship with you, right? Or with a romantic partner or a close friend. Generally, I will require respect, Mm -hmm integrity, kindness, right? Those are like my deal breakers. Mm -hmm. But often we never slow down. We just so much want to be loved and seen that we'll take somebody just because they're showing us attention. That's not necessarily, you know, something to blame or shame yourself over. In fact, it's nothing to blame or shame yourself over. It is about pulling back from that really stepping back and doing the work, doing the exercises that guide you through knowing what it is that is essential to you in your life with yourself, what you want your partner to bring to you or your friends to bring to you, and noticing if there's a discrepancy. Perhaps it's lopsided in your favor where you're expecting respect and kindness and tenderness, but you're not being respectful and kind and tender. Perhaps it's lopsided in the other direction where you are giving 
loads of respect and kindness and tenderness, but you're accepting a partner who's treating you like you're, you know, yesterday's trash. And so that's the idea. And so much personal power starts coming up for people when they realize that this is really about me becoming in tune with me, getting to know me. And it's so empowering. So those are some of the exercises. I love it. Yeah, I think, I mean, honestly, I think for most of us, most of our issues with our health do have a core root in getting to know ourselves. I think, you know, even myself, I'm still working on it. And so many people are are into biohacking their bodies and trying to age gracefully and trying to, you know, find the fountain of youth in all of these different supplements or products and whatnot. But I think what we're skipping over is is the joy and, and really know the joy of knowing ourselves, which leads me into your second book. And I'd love to hear about how the evolution, you told me that both of these books kind of came about in the same year. However, the, the, the joy from fear was about an eight year project. And then the, the aging um, joyfully kind of just came out of it. So, t- so tell us a little bit, about the connection to to getting your best self as you age is it is it you is it working on you still what happens in aging joyfully um so i think just a quick definition of what i mean by joy Mm -hmm. i believe that joy is something that we are it's one of the five core emotions and i believe we're all this is the way i like to visualize it that we are all born the little votive, the little light inside of us. And I am born, and there's my little light. And if I have good enough parenting, my little light burns pretty brightly and gets stronger and stronger. And, of course, we get the little glass jar, the little glass holder around the candle and have some negative life experiences, and it builds up foot. But I know enough, and my parents help me wipe it off, and so my joy burns more and more brightly every year as I learn who I am and explore and expand. Uh Uh-oh, for most of us, that's (laughs) not the case. For most of us, the soot continues to build and build and build and build, and we're just breathing and just getting through life, and oh, one thing after another, we wake up one day and we don't feel the joy. It's there, but it's clouded by so many years of soot of challenges, negative life experiences, hardships, hurts, betrayals. uh. And so for me, the work for us is continuing to clear that motive (laughs) of how much soot, you know, the, the glass of all the soot that has built up. So aging joyfully, and that's where they intersect. The two books intersect. Let's clear off the soot. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's right. Aging joyfully is not about looking young. In fact, I try very hard and I pray it's not anywhere in the book to not use the words looking youthful, looking young, because it's not about. And if people want to do something, you know, to their face or to their body, and that makes them love the face in the mirror or love the body in the mirror, feel connected to that, then, you know, that is always choice, right? choice is good, but it's really about finding the joy within you that may have gotten lost during all your years of caring for others, creating roles of wife, mother, friend, daughter, worker bee, all of (laughs) these roles, and losing yourself in all of that, and how We spend our 20s often creating, you know, relationships and work identity. And our 30s, more of the same, sometimes adding on family. 40s, more of that work, family, um, friends. And then all of a sudden we wake up and we go, who am I? Who is this person sleeping next to me? What's happening? And interestingly, one of the reasons I felt so compelled to rate Aging Joyfully is I'm seeing 20-year-olds in my practice telling me they're old, (laughs) that their life is passing them by. And I'm looking and thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, you're all of 26, and you're feeling not relevant anymore. That's why I hear that I'm not relevant or I'm looking old. And in fact... 
Um, there are a lot of people I know who are starting to use plastic surgery, um, some more cosmetic and, and some surgical, you know, it's all cosmetic, some more superficial, some surgical. At, at 29, at 27, to stave off old age. And um, again, that's all choice, but it's also about doing the internal work. Because I've met 20 and 30 year olds who act like they're 90 or 100. I've also met 80 and 70 year olds who act like they're 12. You know, they're still emotionally mature, but their energy sure. is like that of a five year old or a 12 year old. To me, that's what aging joy is to, regardless of your age, 20, 30, 60, 80, 90, whatever it is, is continuing to realize that because, you know, our culture wants to tell us that we're our most beautiful at, what, 17, 18, 20, I don't know what it is, it doesn't resonate with me at all. Me either. We are our most beautiful now. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow... Are most beautiful tomorrow. I mean, because if we are doing our work, if we are, so I don't see age as a necessary decline. If we want to decline, if we want to live sedentary, kind of lifeless lives, we can do that at 20, mm -hmm. but we don't need to. We can do that at 40, we don't need to. And yes, age will bring limitations. I used to run a lot. Now, you know, my body says more, hey, walking is smarter for you. Yoga is smarter for you. I don't look at it as a loss, but I will see a runner and go, wow, look at, <laughs> look at, you know, look at her form. Wow. Right? But I know that I have my time doing that. And for everything, there's a season. And, now, and so I think it's more about a mindset mindset of having wellness care not sick care but wellness care where we're being really proactive at every age feeding our bodies with the best we can not and you were talking about um, you know people who don't want to be on psychotropic medications and one of the I'm not big on stats but I do like this stat because it makes me angry the 57 percent of people who go to the doctor for mental health care are given medication without psychotherapy to me and this is the example i use and that is the people who actually have the resources to go to therapy right that that tells me that it's much like me going to you and saying excuse me i have this really bad bullet wound in my chest and you're going oh pretty cool here's an antibiotic and a band-aid right right <laughs> and you're leaving me with the bullet in my chest Oh well, yeah, that's what we do here. It saves us money, you know, it saves the healthcare system money. And that's what we're doing because to me, psychological distress is always a sign, just like physical distress. We get a splinter, we get a sore. Something's wrong underneath there. It's calling for attention. So for me, it is really about us normalizing the importance of psychological distress, taking it seriously, and doing the work to get rid of what's underneath. You couldn't have said it any better. It's, oh, I don't know how many ladies come in my office and same thing. They, they've had their children and, and they're like, okay, my kids are either they're grown or their kids are growing up and they don't even know who they are anymore. And then the psychological distress really starts in and the anxiety and the panic attacks and then the depression. And yeah, you, they go to their primary care doc and the doc's like, yeah, here's your band-aid, you know, and, and no psychotherapy. But I think there's also the concept of, of the talk therapy in the case that a lot of people have been like, well, I've heard my friend did it and they just talked and I don't need to talk. I want solutions. And I think that's where your book really hit for me is that you've got some solutions and step-by-step -step work because I think, unfortunately, we've lost the ability to to figure out who we are. We don't even know where to go anymore because we look at social media and we go, Oh, I, I want to be like that person. We like mm -hmm. have like, I want to be this. Oh, look at that gal. She lost a hundred pounds. I want to be that. You know, we, we have lost the ability to tap in and figure out who we are. Absolutely. And I call that, I think in joy from fear, I talk about the toxic voice of comparison. Mm -hmm. And so, and I love the piece that, that you're bringing up about finding when, when a woman wakes up and says, wait, who am I now? I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I'm this and that. And realizing that not all talk therapists are the same. 
and that it's ideal if you can screen. For me, I don't want clients with me year after year after year. And my clients love me because I'm like, let's get you in. Let's do the homework. <laughs> Here, take this with you. You know, email me if you need something or, you know, contact me. To do this work. If you're doing this work, it'll make you go move out of therapy faster. Right. And that is the idea is to give people the skills they need, the tools they need. And that's what's so empowering. And so for someone who has done talk therapy and it hasn't been effective, don't give up. You have other options. Call therapists. Find one that sounds like a better fit, one that gives homework, one who, and I don't mean this unkindly, it's partly a joke, one who doesn't need your sessions to pay their mortgage, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's a bit, a bit jokey there, um, not 100%. But, um, <laughs> I hear you. But, it's, so, but the idea of helping you, that there is a place for talk therapy, yes. There's also a huge place for therapy that is directed toward helping the client learn who he or she is, giving them their sea legs so they can go out and live their lives and be role models for other people. That's how we want to do the work. That's how we want to be. And that's why aging joyfully, I tell people, if you can't afford a book of your own, buy a book with a friend. Create a women's group or a men's group where you're, you know, passing the book around, where you're doing it. That's one of the reasons I love running my women's group because women, because of who we are, you know, genetically, we love to talk. We love to connect. We love our circles. And when we share, and I hear this every week in my women's group, women will say, I was afraid to come at first, mm -hmm. but now I realize I'm not alone. Now I realize my problems are so similar to everybody else's. And by listening to your problem, I've learned more about me, by you hearing about, you know, and they feel validated and empowered. And so that is the idea, even in, in Aging Joyfully and the case examples in Joy From Fear, letting people see that they're not alone that we are all far more similar in this journey of life than we are different. Yeah, the, the steps and the actual situations might be different, but that we all basically are ruled by fear. And the more we learn how to not be ruled by destructive fear, and, and the more we learn to figure out what's making us feel dark or depressed or anxious, we can live joyfully and, again, back to aging joyfully, that's the work. Figuring out at whatever stage you are in life. Um, you haven't read the book, so I don't want to give it away. <laughs> but there are so many exercises in there and wisdom tips nice. where I break it down similar to Joy from Fear, where I offer wisdom tips so that there are simple, doable things you <laughs> can do to revamp your life to make it one that you love. You don't have to be rich. That's it can be on a shoestring budget. It's not about wealth. Some of the wealthiest people I know are some of the most miserable people I know. Mm -hmm. And it is about getting back to the basics. And because if we don't love this being, if we don't love her for all that she is, her mistakes, her successes, her struggles, her challenges, then we've lost lost the focus because it is only through truly coming to know and appreciate and acknowledge and love all that we are all that has allowed this person to be who she or he is that we can then move forward to love, love others and radiate that's aging joyfully that's being joyful is radiating who you are because you're working on her i love it i love it I am excited to read Aging Joyfully, and I hope that a lot of folks are inspired now to check out both of your books. So as it is with all of my podcasts, I like to leave one nugget for folks to just take away from this podcast if they do nothing else. So in the mission of going after learning about yourself, if you can give folks one nugget to take away from this podcast, what would you say? I would say it's something we haven't hit on, and that is... Please don't hit, don't, don't accept, don't embrace the idea that you are broken. But because you are seeing a therapist or you need medication to, to get strong, you're not broken. 
if a medication isn't working for you or a therapy isn't working for you, you're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. It's our system. And that this is about you finding out, having the courage and the strength and please the perseverance <laughs> to find out what does work for you. And it is out there. There are resources out there. You are not unlovable. You are not broken. You are not damaged. You are not defective. You are truly a beautiful human being who is trying to show up to be his or her best self. What could be more beautiful? So that's kind of the what I'd like to leave listeners with. Have faith that you can do this, that you are worth this, and that the world truly does need your light because you are a role model for good or not so good for every person you meet. And you are meant to shine. You truly are. So that's my message. I love it. I love it. So let's talk to folks a little bit about where they can find you. Your books, I know, are both on Amazon. So that's number one place. But let's talk about if someone is looking for services such as yours, where can they find you online and where can they find resources from you? Okay. So... My website, Dr. Carla, C-A-R-L-A, Manly, M-A-N-L-Y dot com. So it's D-R-C-A-R-L-A-M-A-N-L-Y dot com. So that's my website. You'll see my books there. You'll see links to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, also IndieBound. <laughs> because if you are a lover of supporting your local <laughs> community, your local bookstores, IndieBound will let you know where your local bookstore is. And if they don't have Joy from Fear, Agent Joyfully in stock, they can have it lickety split. So that's really wonderful. Also, there are resources on my website. I'm big on resources. Tons of articles I have written. Um, and there and there will be, within the next week, a page called Your Journey. And you'll be able to download one of three assignments that will allow you to do a little bit of your own work. So that will be under the heading of your journey. And um, as far as helping people find a therapist, if you're struggling finding a therapist that is suitable for you in your area, I um, am happy to help try to help somebody find a good fit so they can just email me with the name of their city, state, maybe a presenting issue, and then I can do my best to do some research um, because I'm acutely aware that what is easy for me as a professional, for somebody who's really suffering from anxiety or depression or, you know, chronic stress, you know, a few, a few strokes on the keyboard might be really, really difficult, sure. and that is normal. Oh, well, thank you so much for offering that out to folks. I'll make sure that I put everything in my podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com. So all of you who are listening, it'll be there. And those of you who have subscribed, it'll also go out in the email to you. So you've got two ways to access all of Dr. Manley's information. Dr. Manley, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Wow, Dr. Manley is quite insightful. I can attest to her book being extremely helpful for me. And I hope you go check it out, as the most overlooked aspect of optimizing your health is getting your mind right. If you're looking to take your health to the next level, head over to drjkrausnd.com for this episode's podcast notes, where you'll find a link to Dr. Manley's website to access her book and grab my free four steps to plugging your leaky gut resource to get your gut brain balance dialed in. And whenever you're ready, you can consult with me online. Click on the work with me tab on drjkrausnd.com for more details. Well, that will do it for this episode. Have a great day, whatever you're doing. Hey everybody, Dr. Janine Krause here. If you liked what you heard today, then head over to drjkrausnd.com to find my free resources and information to know when I post something new that's juicy that you might want to check out. Plus, head over to where you get your podcasts and like, subscribe, and write a review to help get the word out about me and help others at the same time to find me. It really does help and I really appreciate all of your reviews.